Reading a magazine on a tablet is nowadays one of the most common ways to do so, and topping this trend is one of the most prestigious companies, Forbes magazine. Welcome to the Social Network Show. There. On today's special series of one-on-one -on -one interviews straight from the New Media Expo, Dr. Nat sits down with Bruce Oppen. Mr. Oppen is the managing editor of the prestigious Forbes magazine. He oversees the wealth and data platforms, including the Forbes 400, the world's billionaires, and the global 2,000 leading companies. Among other things, Dr. Natalie discusses the topic of consumers who want to preserve their pseudonymity to get better offers by giving up some of their privacy. Take it away, Dr. Nat. And so I'm here with Bruce Uppen, and I wanted to talk to him about this article that he just wrote about pseudonymity and anonymity. And so when I read it, it really struck me. Looking at consumers who are trying to preserve their you know, privacy and maybe give up some so they can get better deals, mm -hmm. and social technology companies who are really relying on the data. So I'd like to understand a little bit more about your point of view on that. Okay. So, uh, I mean, in, in the social media world, there's a, a spectrum from totally anonymous, uh, which has its benefits and virtues in, in, in uh, enabling free expression without fear of retribution, all the way to real, the real name movement, if you will, which Facebook uh, has certainly championed. Um, and, and, and I think the, using real names and what people who are so passionate about it believe that it's the path to a global community where people can make true, authentic connections and can speak with, uh, be polite, um, uh, and be authentic, which is a key attribute in social. Um, but if you look at the networks that are, that are truly uh, insistent on, on using your real name and, and actively police fake, fake identities and, and accounts, it's because they have a, a focus on the bottom line and want to sell those names and the behaviors uh, attributed to those names to advertisers like, like Facebook. So to me, what's really interesting is so I've, I've come from the old CRM world, right? I was an analyst and a management consultant. And so our dream was one-to-one -one personalized marketing, right? To be able to tailor the message based on the behavior of that particular consumer and deliver these one-to-one -one messages. Mm -hmm. And so what I wonder is, you know, we have um, Zingo, we have Facebook. Do you think that these two leaders really understood what they were doing when they were building these social networks with respect to one-to-one -one personalization and CRM? Or were they just kind of doing this by the seat of their pants? Well, I don't know if, it's, if there's a CRM component to it, if, if that's what you mean in the classic sense. Um, I, I, I do think that Facebook knew that they wanted real people's lives online. Uh, with Zynga, Zynga was so attached to Facebook from the very beginning that you t traditionally typically brought your Facebook identity to Zynga, and you operated as in Farmville or Cityville as your Facebook identity. Other networks like like Foursquare, for example, or Instagram, uh, were more rel relaxed about that uh, because they didn't really focus on on personalizing the ad stream to your interests. They were more interested in in, in selling your activity to external parties. Uh, so you, the ads would not be within Foursquare. There'd be offers. But it didn't matter if you were if you were Tony T, Bruce U, uh, you know, it didn't matter that you were, I had a last name. They just they just knew that I checked into all these different pizza places, so I should uh, I'm, I'm a, a party of interest to to pizza. Um, but but what what um, um, Foursquare found was that there's now too many Tony T's and Tony S's, so it's not valuable. The names are not as valuable to to advertisers and sponsors, to the to the venues that want to want to see who their best customers are, uh, there is who's Tony S. You know, I don't know who that is. So if they if they, if they become, uh, they're m moving to a full name. If you, it's all opt in. That's the good thing about Foursquare. They're they're allowing you to choose um, rather than forcing it on people. So that becomes a much more valuable um, entity to sell to a venue. What do you think the? Um... To answer your question about whether it's whether it was. Uh, uh, seat of the pants. I think a lot of these companies didn't ha didn't have a revenue idea before they started. They just knew vaguely advertising, but not how. And so, what's interesting to me is there's a lot of belief that investors put in these kids mm -hmm. and about what they did. And hats off to them for what they created and created in a very short period of time. 
but I just wonder if there's kind of a juxtaposition and a conflict of interest for consumers and social technology companies that are really trying to figure out the revenue model. Uh, I think for most of the people of under 30 or under 25, they don't really care. Uh, 80, 89% don't care. I'm just making that up. But a vast, vast majority don't care that their names are being sold or their activities being sold. They think they, they just get enough out of it. and It's free and it's fun and it's easy. Um, but you also see people moving to new platforms like Snapchat uh, where... Or, in, or, in, or, what, or Instagram before it got bought by Facebook, where there is no inkling anywhere of an advertising play. Uh, and that maybe there's, maybe there's a subconscious uh, feeling of comfort there for young people because they, they know they're not going to see Tide or Skechers mm -hmm. or Ford Motor Company in their stream. Uh, once they start seeing it, they back off. But I don't think it's because their names are showing up. I just think they don't like ads. I think people of a certain age, younger, are used to getting things for free and used to uh, uh, not buying things. Basically, they, they, they rent things and they steal things. <laughs> right. I taught a couple of courses and uh, we did some market research. One of the students' um, thesis was about music and um, ripping it off, basically, and that, that she interviewed a bunch of students her own age and they basically didn't think it was illegal, which was really an interesting point of view for millennials and Gen X and Gen Y versus the baby boomers, which we would never think of doing that. It's quite different. I mean, I, but, but then, then you have to think about personal expression, which is very important to everybody, no matter what your age is. And for a lot of people, um, it depends on the media being expressed. But on Spotify, you are, it's, a real name, it's a real name network. And people, I think, are, are interested in sharing their playlists with their friends and seeing what their friends, their real friends, are listening to. Whereas on a Reddit for example, which is bigger than Spotify as a network, uh, it's much more anonymous, and there's a lot more bad behavior, but a lot more fun, I think. There's a lot more, that's a, that's a tremendously valuable uh, network without anyone ever knowing anyone else's name. And it's, it becomes a big problem when someone gets outed. The whole community rallies around protecting the anonymity of the either the admins or the, or the, the dwellers in whatever subreddit you're talking about. Yeah, the behavior in communities is really fascinating to me. So if you were a startup and we look back at what the two marks have done, what do you think they did well and what do you think they could improve upon in terms of, because there's it kind of reminds me of the dot-com era mm -hmm. where a lot of people were convinced that there was real business to be had. And, you know, 10, 15 years later, we see that there is a very big component of online businesses but at the time, a lot of the investors didn't get their return on their investment. So I'm just wondering, in the investment community, um, there's a lot of bets going on. Who's going to be able to monetize this stuff? Looking back at the mistakes or the good things that these two guys have done, what do you think companies should look for? If you're starting a new social network now, I think I think if you want to, I don't think you can you can't you can't make any money replicating what they did. I mean, Zynga is for all of its investor distaste is a big business still. It's still a couple hundred million dollars a quarter in revenue. It stopped growing. That's the problem, is it was a fad. Um, but it was a well-executed fad. Uh, I don't think if they had done, if they had, let's say they'd spam, all the things people hate Zynga for, if they had not spammed their users as much, uh, if their games were a little more original, um, if they weren't so reliant on Facebook, uh, those are things that investors, that entrepreneurs right now and venture capitalists are looking at those are the, the key mistakes that Zynga made. The big one now for a lot of new startups is don't be too dependent on one platform, uh, which is not a flaw for Facebook, that they are the platform. Um, but that was one of their hallmarks, is that they focused just on the platform. And, and, and they could do even, an even better job making it easier for app developers to write to Facebook. They haven't even had a developer conference. Uh, remember the F8? Oh, yeah. They, yeah. They, it's been two years since they've had one, and I was asking them why, and they said, well, we don't really want to do things just just because we just because it's an anniversary of a, of a certain last year. Huh. They, they do it when they have something to tell people, and they're always working with developers on the side. So so lot, every company I talk to now, every startup that has a social app or something, they they always they go on to Facebook, they, they make Facebook their, a, a big bet, but they, don't, they do whatever they can to avoid putting all their chips in that on that, on that uh, metaphor, the circle, the, the number. Um, and there's other ones that you can, you can play, but not, not that many. So they, what they're forced to do is try to create their own using Facebook identity. 
uh, as, as the one, um, and then using social, you know, signaling socially to, to the Facebook platform, like a fab or a, a rap or Wantful or a lot of the companies we've been writing about um, get all their inbound referrals by allowing their users to signal socially wherever it is. I was just talking to a company called Fan Apps, F A N A P P Z, mm -hmm. and what I found interesting about them is they are very interested in helping marketers um, gain more viewers and ha increase the engagement. But their play doesn't stop there. Their play is really about gathering that customer data and then helping that marketer become a lot smarter. Right. So it's a whole kind of database marketing mm -hmm. um, play. What do you think about that? I mean, that's a, that's a key. Um idea for e-commerce companies is that that's what they they're not quite that but if you look at a birch box or um uh there's uh there's there's a company called scavenger without the vowels um i know isn't it funny how all these names have no vowels yeah. Flickr started that just drop the e um they these companies are not really e-commerce they're not consumer companies they do they do have a consumer uh, value they give you samples but all they're all they are really is is a it's B two B to C where they they're in the middle, um, delivering something to consumers, but in order to get information back to the brands, um, it's a, it's an old business like sampling does that and a lot of sampling companies out there. Um, it's interesting even 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 Uber the the car share the car. I love Uber. When I'm in a city it. and I can't find a taxi, yeah. they rock. I mean Uber sees their customers as the drivers as much as it is the passengers. It's a great experience for passengers, but they want drivers to, to learn more and know more and give more information to the drivers using their platform. Um, and same with Birchbox, where they, they change the offering all the time. And, and that, in that way, they get around the bad economics of e-commerce, because e-commerce is, is a pretty tough business. Uh, there haven't been that many great exits in the public markets, and Amazon pretty much owns a lot of the value in that, in that business. Yeah, Amazon. Well, what's interesting about Amazon and the whole idea around brand advocates and advocacy was they, a lot of people don't know this, is when they were first starting out, and you probably know this, what they did was they went back and asked certain customers who kept giving them feedback, which was always interesting. I used to work in call centers a lot, and so the customers would be giving feedback to the company, but they weren't interested in, they just saw those people as complaining versus that could be gold. And one of the smart things that Amazon did was they took those people and they created affinity groups and really exploited the ability to take that feedback and integrate it. So when I talk to CEOs and they say, Dr. Knapp, this social media stuff, don't tell anybody, I really don't get it. And I say, well, do you want to increase revenue? Do you want to decrease mm -hmm. costs? And they're like, yeah, okay, tell me more. So I kind of think that it's what we've all wanted corporate life to look like, to be authentic and direct and to have the voice of the consumer or customer reflected. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, the best companies do listen more than they speak and observe more than they listen. Um, you don't, you don't want to, the, the best companies do like Intuit, for example, which I wrote about back in April, they, they move by, by moving all, especially in nowadays when, when you can, in the software industry, when you can be a cloud company now, all of your customer interaction is now instrumented. Every ounce, every pixel of your website and every email that can be uh, analyzed for what people click on, what they don't click on, uh, how long they stay once they click on certain areas. We do it on our, our news site all the time. Um, so you can be making changes all the time and testing things all the time without really list, without actually having a focus group or doing the traditional means of customer listening and, ex and experience. Uh, it's just it's, it's 24 hours a day. Um, social is a little bit harder because uh, you have to, I mean, you have to understand where people are coming from a little more. It's not really behavior. You need to then, plenty of companies do this, where they, they have someone watching all the feeds, and then you begin to engage with some people and actually get them to tell the story of what actually happened here. Can we figure this out together? Um, the best companies do that really well. I mean, Dana White, who we're going to hear from tomorrow, he's actually had, he's actually, he's seen tweets from fans that have, had a bad seat at a fight, at, you know, a, a mixed martial arts fight. They were sitting behind the video booth, and they and so he and they sent a picture. They tweeted a picture of, "Look at my crappy seats." Right. And so he had them moved, right within ten minutes. See, and what great PR is that? Yeah. So we hit, we're going to use it tomorrow on stage as more PR, but th that's real response time. You don't see many CEOs even on Twitter. 
Well, what's interesting is in the call center, we always used to try to get the CEOs to come to the call center and listen to calls, and they wouldn't. So then we would tape the calls and play it in the boardroom, and they'd be like, oh, my God, this is terrible. We have to make this stop happening. And then we'd say, well, in order to do that, here's the 100 things we'd have to change. Oh, well, we can't really do that. So you start to look at customer lifetime value, you start to look at you know the cost of acquiring customers. It just seems to me that makes business sense to really listen to the voice of the customer. And there's a lot of good data in social. And there's also, I mean, you can get a lot more data from these premium models where, where uh, people you know use it, you get a lot more people in the door. Uh, and then you get more people you know, re reaching the limit, whether it's a storage, you know, the number of uh, you know, bytes or megabits they can use. You can quickly, uh, you don't have to, especially web businesses, it's much cheaper to service people and make changes, and, and you'd, be, you'd be remiss in not doing so. So can you share with us what you guys are doing at Forbes? And where do you start? We well, so many things. okay, so give us some insight. Well, we, uh, we just launched our new mobile magazine, which we're pretty proud of. It's a kind of a blend of print, tablet and social all at once it takes we, we haven't had a magazine app we don't, we don't we didn't believe in just putting our magazine on on a tablet and we didn't have the resources of a Condé Nast say you know to, to do to spend uh, a year building this this uh, a, a workflow and a tool so uh, we found a great startup uh, these guys out of Adobe uh, who can take uh, PDFs of a magazine of our, our issue each issue and uh, render on a tablet beautifully and then and then we can you could tap certain uh, you know, a photo or a diagram or a, a, a pull quote, um, and get more from our web. And, you, and we can integrate because our magazine comes out every two weeks or so. But we we run 300, 400 stories a day online, much bigger than the magazine. So we wanted to give people a sense of what's going on behind each issue, and so that's flows at the top. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, there's so much going on. We we our our focus right now is quality. We have we have scale. We built the site from uh, 17 million uniques to 38, 39 now, wow, uh, just in two years. Yeah, we've, we've had uh, tremendous growth. We've been grateful for that, uh, both in print and web. But um, growing that fast meant that we have we brought a lot of contributors on that we have to kind of take a look at and maybe start to call a little bit and, and give them better training, more training. So we've become uh, a, a training organization. Uh, my job is more, much more training now than it is actually editing and writing. And what do you think makes a really good columnist? Uh, they have to spell, <laughs> good grammar, details, yeah. original ideas, yeah. uh, get rid of the rhetorical questions, don't just look at your navel. Um, a lot of people just, just start typing and they, the, the, the blog posts just kind of spool off into meaningless um, you know, prognostication. I think you need to pick up the phone and call before you post. Um, unless you're writing about something you know about that's, that happened to you personally, some of our best posts have been business stories that were born out of personal experience. Like I walked into a Best Buy and here's what I saw. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to tell people don't, don't feel the need to write something every day if you don't have something to say. And so in, what would you like to leave us in terms of wisdom? Like you're here at the show, we're seeing a lot of new technology, we're, we're going to get to hear you speak and a lot of other thought leaders. What do you think is the most important thing that people should pay attention to? Wow, um, I would think the the quality of their thought their, their thoughts. Um, I would I tell people to read to read out loud what they what they what they write. That's a great idea. Uh, even backwards, um, because nothing will destroy your credibility more than um, a, a lazy sentence, missing words, bad spelling. That's just the copy editor in me. But uh, I would encourage people to to think a lot more before they write. Um, and write a lot more before they publish and publish a lot more before they start talking to the world about it. Amazing wisdom. Thank you, Bruce, very much. Sure. Thank you. Wise indeed, Dr. Natalie. This is it for now, but next week's show, Dr. Natalie discusses inventing the future. Is this really possible? We'll tell you all about a new interactive show that is the lifeline between scientists and people just like us. We'll explain in next week's show. See you then.